Good afternoon. I am the chair of the Committee on Governmental Operations, Council Member Fernando Cabrera. Today we're conducting an oversight on community boards, operations, and needs. We also have in our first hearing on my legislation introduction 1095 of 2018 relating to notification expiration of special permits granted by the Board of a Standard of or Appeal or BSA and the inclusion of community boards in notification for both variances and special permit. New York City's 59 community boards provide an invaluable forum for residents to stay informed about current events in their community, provide feedback to government agencies on local impacts of state and local policy, and inform how public services can be delivered effectively. We are interested in hearing how some recent changes to our charter approved by the voters in November have or will impact community boards. The first change is the establishment of a civic en engagement commission to start in April, which is intended to provide resources and training to community boards. The second change is the imposition of term limits on community board members, a maximum of four conse consecutive two-year terms. We are also interested in having a conversation about funding for our community board. In its fiscal year 2019 budget, the City Council allocated 42500 to each community board in supplementary other than personnel services or OTPS funding to be used as each community so fit. Council staff reached out to community boards to learn more about how this funding was spent and we would like to hear more from the community boards here today on how they may use of this additional funding. In today's hearing, we're also having a first hearing on my legislation, Introduction 1095 of 2018. This bill amends Local Law 84 of 2017, which currently requires the Bo Board of Standards and Appeals to provide a notification to the owner of record when a variance is about to expi expire to now also require that the BSA provide notification to the owner of record when a special permit is about to expire. Special permits allow a, a certain use in a zoning district where that use might not otherwise be allowed, such as an auto service station in a commercial district or an electric or gas utility substation in a residential district. Use of the property after the special permits expiration may be a violation of a certificate of occupancy. <coughs> Excuse me. The BSA will be required to inform the owner that the special permit cannot be extended until penalty for such a violations are paid. The bill will also require the notification of both variances and special permits to be sent to the community board in which the property is located. The notification will be required to go out six months before the special permit expires. I will also like to give I would like to give a special, very special thanks to our recently promoted and now former counsel Brad Reed. Thank you for your dedication to the work of this committee. Uh, we will certainly miss you. You're an amazing counsel, and I know that um, uh, as you rise uh, in the ranks, uh, it's because of your leadership and uh, in the wisdom that you have provided this council and to many other committee uh, chairs and uh, committees. So I want to thank personally thank you. <coughs> You're an amazing person to work with. Uh, and of course, uh, I want to thank the rest of the staff who made this hearing possible. Our new council, uh, committee council, Daniel Collins, we welcome you. So glad that um, <coughs> you were able to uh, join us and be part of this amazing team, uh, which uh, total pleasure to work with, which includes Elizabeth Cronk, Emily Ford Jones, Zach Harris, and Charlotte Martin, as well as my own legislative director, Claire McLevin. And now we will turn to our first uh, panel. Uh, Marjorie uh, Prom Promoter, Carla Const Carlo Constanza, and Kirk Steinhaus. If you could come forward, and then we will be swearing you in. And
Once you all get settled, we'll do the oath. You can sit down. <laughs> this is good. This is feel at home. Feel at home. Uh, if you could please write your right hands. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? You could begin. Thank you so much. Yeah, the red button. The red button. Okay. On now? Yes. Good morning, Chair Cabrera and council members of the Committee on Governmental Operations. I am Marjorie Perlmutter, Chair of the New York City Board of Standards and Appeals. I am also here with members of the BSA's Executive Office and Council's Office. Carlo Costanza to my right, who is the Executive Director. Kurt Steinhaus to my left, who is Deputy General Counsel. And in the audience, we have General, we should have coming shortly, General Counsel L'Oreal Monroe. Um, Assistant Counsel Chase Vine uh, and Tony Matias, our director of um, <coughs> our deputy director, and we also have watching one of our commissioners, um, Sal Shibeta. Um, I am here to express the BSA's support of the legislative proposal to require notifications to community boards and property owners of the expirations of terms of variances. Uh, and special permits granted by the board. I would also like to update you on our implementation of legislation enacted in 2017 and that, uh, that addresses board issues and bring attention to a concern about the resources necessary to implement this newly proposed legislation. Let me start with a brief background on the Board of Standards and Appeals. Since 1916, the board has worked to administer zoning, building, and housing regulations in a fair and just manner to protect the city's interest in safeguarding the general welfare while balancing private property interests. In this role, the board has frequently been called a, quote, relief valve, a protector of the city's regulations from constitutional challenge, and a guardian of the urban fabric. Under Section 659 of the New York City Charter, the board is an independent agency that consists, consists of five full-time commissioners with select skill sets, including experience in architecture, urban planning, and engineering, which are supported by a staff of 19 employees. The board's commissioners also reside in different boroughs, with no more than two commissioners residing in the same borough. The geographic diversity further imbues the board's commissioners with a diversity of viewpoints beyond their professional qualifications. Using their technical expertise and independent judgment, each commissioner scrutinizes every land use application with the utmost of care. Commissioners review frequently involves analyzing intricate construction documents, financial statements, testimony from other government agencies, and site conditions gleaned through visits to the properties and neighborhoods at issue. Too much feedback? Yeah, you can shut the other one. This one? Yeah, yeah. that's why you're getting feedback. There you go. Okay, yeah, maybe that. <coughs> the board staff of 19 employees currently manages 103 years of archives and 566 pending applications. Since 1998, the board has had approximately 14,000 applications filed, an average of about 700 applications per year over the past two decades. Under the direction of the board, you can, can you? Under the direction of the board's executive director and deputy director, these 700 applications are reviewed by four full-time project managers, one part-time project manager, and one environmental officer. Just to underscore how many we review by how few to do the work. Um, once applications are deemed complete by a project manager, the board's executive director schedules them for a public hearing in accordance with section 661 of the city charter. On the day before the public hearing, the board holds a review session which allows the board's commissioners to discuss the merits of each application in a meeting open to the general public pursuant to section 1060 of the city charter. The following day, the board holds a public hearing where applicants and their team of attorneys, engineers, and design professionals present proposals before the board and any members of the public in attendance. Other stakeholders, including tenants, 
Members of the community, other agencies, and elected officials are also welcome to present additional information that the board should consider before voting on an application. Many applications involve complex facts and circumstances that warrant continued hearings, so missing the first public hearing does not mean a stakeholder's chance to weigh in is lost, and I wanted to introduce our general counsel, Lori L. Monroe, who just walked in. Um, each year, the board holds approximately 70 public hearings and review sessions and considers about 25 to 30 applications in each hearing. Both public hearings and review sessions are open to the general public in accordance with Section 663 of the City Charter, as well as the New York State Open Meetings Law. In furtherance of the board's commitments to transparency, all of the board's public hearings and review sessions are recorded and posted publicly within one day through the board's website on YouTube. Remote access to the board's hearings also furthers community engagement by allowing stakeholders the opportunity to learn about applications and to listen to the board discussing the merits of each case. After considering the record in its entirety and deliberating in public, the board votes on the application. Under Section 663 of the City Charter, a majority of the, of the board must vote in the affirmative to grant an application, otherwise the application is denied. Every one of the board's decisions is explained in writing in the form of a written resolution. These written re resolutions, drafted by our staff of three attorneys, must be detailed and describe the reasons for the board's decision in accordance with Section 668 of the City Charter and Section 25-206 of the Administrative Code. Decisions of the board are then subject to judicial review pursuant to Section 25-207 of the Admin Code and Article 78 of Civil Practice Law and Rules. The board's three attorneys support the city's law department, which represents the board in litigation, in approximately 10 challenges per year, and some of our challenges take an enormous amount of time for our attorneys to address. Community boards are an invaluable participant throughout the board's current application processes. For decades, community boards have enhanced neighborhood participation by allowing communities a strong voice in shaping important land use decisions, and the board's application processes reflect the significance of community boards' vital role. Consistent with Section 668 of the City Charter, community boards receive copies of all the board's application materials, as well as follow-up submissions, because community boards provide a first-level neighborhood-based review of the applications. After they receive a copy of these application materials, community boards may then conduct a public hearing and submit a written recommendation to the board, or they may opt not to do so. These community-level hearings provide an opportunity for concerned citizens to learn more about an applicant's initial proposal and express concerns that may then be incorporated into the community board's official recommendation to the Board of Standards and Appeals. The, the board fosters community board testimony fosters further community testimony by requiring that notice of our hearings be mailed to neighbors 20 days in advance of the first hearing and encouraging community participation in the hearing process. The board's commissioners consider every concern expressed by the community and by community boards in accordance with section 66 of the city charter. The input of community boards is invaluable. At each hearing, I read the community board's recommendation aloud, and the board then ensures that the applicant address any, addresses any concerns expressed by the community board and also other members of the community. Frequently, community boards also re recommend specific conditions, which are often incorporated into the project and then become part of the board's approval and written resolution. This ensures that community boards continue to enhance neighborhood participation by allowing communities a strong voice in shaping important land use decisions and is one way that the board recognizes the significance of the community board's role. I would also note that while many community boards provide their recommendations to the board in written form, community boards are always welcome to attend the board's public hearings and offer testimony and recommendations in person. Furthermore, the board appreciates community input, which can provide additional information about the history of a site and how the site has been doing. 
This allows the board to address the community's concerns by requiring an applicant to be responsive to them. The board often hears applications for renewals of special permits and variances for automotive uses, for example. Commissioners visit these sites and may observe that the site under consideration is in terrible condition with litter strewn about, cars crowding onto the sidewalks, fences collapsing, covered in graffiti, and paint peeling. In other words, an eyesore and a nuisance and in violation of the condition of the board's prior grant. Without community testimony, the board would not know how long the site has been poorly maintained, nor the community's efforts to bring it under control. Armed with this community supplied information, the board can require that the applicant clean up the site before entertaining any request for renewal of the term of a previous grant. The vast majority of applicants cooperate with the board's directions, which allows the applicant to, live, to deliver back to the community a much improved and even attractive site that contributes to rather than detracts from neighborhoods. Through these open and productive communications with the board, communities learn how seriously the board takes their concerns and understands that applicants can be brought back before the board with a compliance hearing should the site fall into back into disarray. Accordingly, for more than 100 years, the Board of Standards and Appeals has been serving New Yorkers by providing relief from regulations that affect the use and development of real property to ensure that sites will be used and developed safely and respectfully. And for decades, community boards have played an integral role in the board's decision-making process by providing invaluable recommendations and information about on-the-ground conditions. Next, and really finally, I hope this doesn't, I would like to provide an update on the board's implementation of recent legislation, which I understand you wanted to hear about. In 2017, the City Council passed nine bills relating to the Board of Standards and Appeals and its operations, which were signed into law on May 30th, 2017. These bills address concerns relating to the board's transparency, consideration of community comments, and the veracity of applicants' submissions and testimony. The board has since undertaken a number of initiatives to ensure implementation of these bills, as well as measures of its own to further promote transparency and community engagement. With respect to presentations before community boards, the board has issued an administrative notice, which I think we have copies, we have copies of the administrative notices that I'll refer to. Board has issued an administrative notice to ensure that applicants provide to the board copies of presentation materials used before community boards. These materials may include handouts, photocopies of poster boards, and copies of slideshow presentations. Copies of these materials are due within 10 days of presentation, and the reason for this was that community boards were concerned that they were seeing something different than what the board was seeing, so it was a way for community boards to connect back with us and us to understand what it was the applicant was really showing them. Applicants also must comply with the board's requirement for proof of service at every public hearing, videos of which are available through the board's website. The board begins by discussing compliance with the required proof of service and notice of hearing. If an applicant has failed to comply with these requirements, the board postpones the hearing until they have been met. Um, with respect to mapping and open data, the board has provided data to the city's open data portal in the form of a geocoded data set, as well as a map of the board's applications. This transparency measure allows the public to see information about applications filed and visualizes decisions the board has made since 1998. Furthermore, the bo board posts biannual reports on the number of variants and special permit applications, decisions, and withdrawals to the front page of its website, and it forwards copies of these reports as required to the City Council and makes copies available on request, and I believe we have a sample that's included in your package of that City Council, that report to the Council. Um, with respect to the Department of City Planning, the board has added a tab to its website to ensure easy access to any city planning testimony, um, but we don't yet, as far as I know, have city planning's um, liaison, assign I don't know. We, we speak to city planning regularly about projects, so, or let's say our staff does. With respect to providing access to the advice of a state certified general real estate appraiser, 
The board has reached out to the Department of Citywide Administrative Services, which performs specified administrative functions for the board under Section 829 of the City Charter regarding contracting of outside consultants, and dis discussions are ongoing. However, this is an area where resources present a challenge. Um, additionally, I would note that one of the board's commissioners has strengths in real property feasibility analyses. So to just back that up a little bit more, we've been trying to hire an outside consultant appraiser, but the problem is it must be contracted and we're not a contracting agency. ECAS has to do that for us. So, so far we haven't been able to piggyback on any existing contracts that DCAS already has with appraisal and real estate. They have, for instance, a contract with CBRE Richard Ellis, but we've been unable to connect to that. Um, with respect to the testimony and application materials provided by applicants, the board now requires applicants, applicants' representatives, and other fact witnesses to affirm their testimony under oath live at hearings, exactly as we just did here. The board also posted an administrative notice on its website about the board's expectations for the affirmation process, and the board plans to update its rules to incorporate feedback on this and other administrative notices, and that notice is also in your package. The board is also in the process of revising its application materials, which will include a more detailed certification form to ensure that applicants are made more aware of the consequences of providing false information to the board. Actually, I believe that certification form was mounted Friday on our website. Um, the board continues to refer what it perceives as false statements made by applicants and their representatives to the Department of Investigation for appropriate enforcement. As to minimum required materials, the board has issued an administrative notice about construction cost estimates to standardize expectations and provide consistency in the application process. And the board has recently released updated guidelines for drawings, which will be effective March 1st, 2019. The board also instructs applicants as to best practices for minimum required materials by providing sample documents. With respect to written determinations, the board has hired an additional attorney who's present here, um, Chase Vine, bringing its legal staff to three in order to enhance the responsiveness of the board's resolutions to community concerns. Drafting res resolutions is an arduous process that involves a review and summary of the entire administrative record, including notes taken while attending public hearings, listening to the videos, and testimony from elected officials and members of the community to ensure accuracy and completeness of information. Lastly, and most relevant to our discussion today, the existing legislation enacted in 2017 provides that the board will ensure that, quote, for any variance granted by the board after December 31st, 2013, for which the board imposed a term, the board shall notify the owner of record of the subject property that the term of such variance will expire under section 25-209 of the admin code. As a preliminary matter, I would note that resources were not a concern with this uh, expiration notice requirement enacted in 2017 because few variance with gra variances granted since 2013 include a term that will expire. For instance, of the 167 variances granted since December 31, 2013, the board imposed a term on approximately three. Um, when, while the board has taken steps towards providing notice of variance expirations, the board does not expect this requirement to impose any significant burden on resources because, as I mentioned, the universe of variances granted since 2013 that are subject to a term that will expire is minuscule. Thanks to these nine bills, the board was also able to hire three additional staff members, an IT professional, a compliance officer, and our third attorney, all of whom have been instrumental in the above implementation measures. Lastly, now that I have provided some background on the board and measures it has taken to implement recent legislation, I would like to touch on why I support this bill that you're proposing and would also like to bring attention to the resources necessary to implement broader notification requirements. 
expanding the recently enacted requirement for notifying proper property owners about variance expirations to notifying both property owners and community boards about the expiration of variances and special permits is a laudable idea. As I discussed earlier, increasing communication between community boards and the board is a commendable goal because community boards are crucial to the board's decision-making process. And I just add as an aside that I think it's very important that property owners be alerted when these permits expire. Often they're not aware of it for whatever reason. Um, so I will address the resources that would be necessary to implement this <coughs> legislation. In contrast to the three or so variances that have been granted with terms since 2013, expanding expiration notices to special permit applications granted with terms since 2013 and, and what did I say again? Since 2013, sorry, um, for which the, Thank sorry. Sorry, sorry, sorry. And requiring notification of community boards as well as property owners would call for significantly more resources and at least one new staff member to implement. Unlike the three variances granted with terms since 2013, the board has granted 251 special permits with terms since then. These 251 special permits have terms imposed by the zoning resolution and do not include any special permits with terms granted at the board's discretion. But like the three variances with terms, this number would be minimal. Almost all of these 251 special permit applications, such as for gyms, drive-throughs, and eating and drinking establishments, and it is also for gas stations, but we see fewer of those than we do for the other things. Um, they allow uses that require continued vigilance to ensure that the board's conditions and safeguards are observed. That is why expiration notices for community boards is a laudable goal. Community boards provide invaluable insight into the on-the-ground conditions in the neighborhoods. However, at a rate of about 250 special permits with terms granted every five years, it would not take long for the number of notices to property owners and community boards to grow exponentially as new special permits are granted and others are renewed. Even special permits terms vary. Some, like gyms, have maximum terms of 10 years under section 7336 of the zoning resolution and occasionally we grant them for shorter periods when there's difficulties with the gyms. Others, like drive-throughs, have maximum terms of five years under section 73243 of the zoning resolution. Implementing an expanded notification requirement for the expiration of variances and special permits would require additional resources for the board staff of 19 employees. The board's single IT professional, who we only hired for the very first time, our first IT professional, we just hired in the last year, is already hard at work implementing recent legislation and pursuing additional initiatives to streamline the board's application processes that IT person would need to design an entirely new component of the board's internal database system to manage and track expiration dates. Data would need to be entered into the new component of the board's database. Staff would need to monitor expiration dates. Each letter would need to be drafted and reviewed for accuracy since the special permits are different and concern different things. Uh, mailing addresses for property owners who may have changed multiple times since the time of the last board action at a property would need to be researched using the board's records and other available public sources. And resolutions would be retrieved, printed, and included with the notice letter to, as an attachment. Addresses for community boards that also change would also need to be researched and continuously kept up to date. Normally the community board reaches out to us, not the other way around. Um, Letters would be sent by certified mail, a cost that would only grow over time. Return receipts would need to be logged. Tracking data would need to be logged. Um, notice letters would become part of the board's record and would need to be filed in a new digital archive, which would be more efficient than retrieving the paper case file from the board's off-site archives. Each letter would also need to be tracked for compliance purposes, and staff would need to respond to inquiries from property owners who just realized, uh-oh, now I have to renew my special permit. Um, and community boards also would be and asking questions about the notices they've received regarding the imminent expiration of variances and special permits. All of which is to say 
that a clerical assistant to support the board's compliance officer would be necessary to implement an expanded notification requirement for the expiration of variances and special permits. The board's single compliance officer, which I'm proud to report is our first compliance officer ever, um, who has um, not yet been assigned the task of tracking variances with terms granted since 2013, is frequently in the field on site, exper ex site inspections, attending public hearings, and coordinating with the Department of Buildings, Fire Department, and other enforcement agencies. These duties do not, at this time, allow for the monitoring of hundreds of expiration dates and drafting and tracking newly required notices for hundreds of special permit applicants applications. With the above considerations in mind, I fully support this proposal to ensure that community boards and property owners receive notice of the expiration of variances and special permits. I only ask that the City Council be mindful of the resources necessary to implement this proposed legislation should it be enacted. Uh, and I'm happy to take any questions. <coughs> Look forward to hearing ideas on how to improve the board's application processes. Thank you so much for uh, your testimony. Uh, Thank you for the details you provided and, and for the work that you're doing with only 19 employees is amazing. I want to recognize that we've been joined by council members myself, uh, Jaeger, and Powers. I have a, I only got a couple of questions and I'll turn it over to my colleagues if they have questions. So just to be clear, at this point, do you have a tracking system in place for the expiration of special permits? We do not. Right? It's, uh, it's currently being developed. We say, say who you are. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm Carlo Costanza, Executive Director of the Board. Uh, we just currently, in the last month, rolled out a, uh, a new database, uh, and a whole new digital uh, system, cloud-based, and we're working on that component um, in anticipation of the expiration of the terms that we were working on, uh, but that's where we're at at this moment. And when do you foresee that uh, it will be completed and ready to be functioning? We hope uh, within maybe the next six months to, to nine months. Okay, great, great, fantastic. Um, my second question is related uh, to how many special permits do you, do you expect will be granted annually uh, you said you had 251 since 2015, 2013. Uh, so if you could tell us what are you anticipating, I know it's hard to forecast, and, uh, but what are you forecasting? Well, um, as, as far as special permits that have a statutory requirement of a term, um, like I said, based on that average, it looks approximately 50 per year. Uh, obviously, the board has the discretion to impose terms on non-statutory requirements uh, as far as terms go, but uh, we didn't calculate that into the testimony, so it's a little hard to figure that out. Um, but, you know, it could be 50, it depend. I'm sorry, it, no, it, it, does, it does depend on the year and the types of filings, but we'll roughly stay to about 50 a year at this point. 50. And I, I just want to add that, oops. Sorry. Sorry, maybe I'll yeah, just, just if you could, I'll no, move it within. that way. Yeah, keep them away from each other. There okay. you go. I, I just want to add that um, the number of special permits it really is a factor, the number of special permits we see really is a factor of sort of economic time. So for instance, imagine 30 years ago, the number of gyms that we see today. I live in a neighborhood where there's probably 30 gyms on a two block distance, right? And so every single week we get a filing for a gym, but so those are special permits that have a 10 year term. Um, could we think in the future that we've sort of burned out gyms maybe, or that all the gyms that are ever going to be have received their special permits? Who knows, right? So, or it could be a huge increase because they invent yet another form of wall climbing or something like that, right? Right, uh, I want to recognize Councilwoman Kalos. Uh, do we have any questions from, wow, amazing. Yes, Councilman Mark Kalos. I uh, want to first uh, loud Committee Chair Cabrera on introduction 1095 to provide notices. Uh, last term we had focused just on the property owners and I think it's also important to 
notify the community boards so that they can take appropriate action. Uh, in uh, page six of your testimony, uh, you make reference to one of the bills that was previously passed that mandates uh, a state certified general real estate appraiser and uh, it, it appears that you are indicating that you, are, you have not succeeded in complying right. with that legislation. Right. Um, I think you might have missed the testimony on that. So uh, as you may know, we are actually the sort of administrative functions are handled for us by DCAS, right? So uh, when we need to um, pursue some kind of a contract, we have to go to DCAS and see if there's a way for them to um, handle letting out a contract. DCAS already has a relationship with CBRE Richard Ellis. Last I knew, that was a, a contract that they, who they work with, which includes a lot of appraisers. Um, so we had asked whether there was some way to join in to that contract, and it turns out that for whatever reason, they do a different kinds of thing. The, the contract isn't what we need. We have about, I think we estimated about 10 or 10 or 20 applications per year. We'll, we'll check that number where a financial analyst is needed. Those are the variance applications where we have financial analysis done. Filed since January 25th. Okay, so 25 variance is filed since January 17 for which financials were provided. Our um, financial specialist who sits on the commission uh, is the one that who we rely on currently to review these things, but um, really would love to have someone who, like an appraiser who could help with that. Um, but unfortunately, at the moment, we haven't been able to find, get a contract with someone who can look at 25 of these applications a year. Obviously, that would be like a part-time person or a kind of a per diem as opposed to a full-time staff member, right, or a contracted person who comes on demand. We have an uh, inherent interest in the City Council in seeing our laws followed. Uh, how can we support? Is this follow up with DCAS? Is this followed up with the Mayor's Office of Contract Services? How do we how do we get the RFP issued or the contract issued so that you have the the real estate appraiser to which you are uh, legally entitled? Do you know, would you mind answering? Yeah, I was I was just well, gonna just. So part of the difficulty we've had is that, as Madam Chair stated, we've been unable to piggyback on an existing contract, which to the best of our understanding, there's only one requiring a new RFP. Um, in our discussions, it's at least a two-part analysis where there's an appraiser section and um, a comparable section done. It's, it seems to be quite expensive uh, more than we anticipated and monies were allotted for. So we're still working with them to see if there's a, a solution that we could afford with the funding we have. Sounds Dennis. like you should be at the budget hearing for <laughs> GovOps <laughs> requesting <laughs> adequate funding for this position. Thank you very much. But thank you. Thank you. I just have one last question before, <coughs> excuse me, uh, we go to uh, hearing from community boards, and thank you to all the community bo uh, boards for being so uh, patient. Uh, but uh, you gave us an update in Local Law uh, 103, uh, 2017, uh, which among other provisions established a civil penalty for making false statements to the BSA, uh, provided that a person won't be subject to penalty if they notify the BSA of a false statement violation prior to receiving notice of the potential violation. So the question then is, has the BSA issued any notice of violation of this provision? For example, has the BSA alleged that any false statements have been made to the BSA since the local law's enactment? So perhaps I only am able to counsel to respond, but I, I just want to say that. Um, Happily, it doesn't happen often, but there are times when we are aware that someone is making, we have everybody swear in, and we remind um, the council who represent, the lawyers therefore, who represent our applicants, that they're under oath as fact witnesses, and that they should not be making statements unless they know that th them to be factually correct, or they should qualify them, right? There are rare times when we are aware that there's been a misrepresentation, 
we will state that we think that something doesn't sound right. We will say that at the hearing, and then our counsel then refers it to the Department of Investigation. We don't have an enforcement wing in our agency, nor the ability to do those kinds of investigations. So, but whether we send out a notice, you know, D DOI tends to be quite secretive. You report to them, and then that's, they do whatever they do, right? So we have no idea whether they follow up or what they've done or um, if anyone feels reprimanded in the end. I don't know if there's anything you wanted to add to that. Okay. Okay, so the DOI has never gotten back to you or you have never heard of a case that they pursued and end up being uh, publicly known, right? They're not, I think they're not allowed to monthly, right? They're but once they conclude their investigation, let's say that they wanted to pursue with penalties or whatever course yeah. of action, you, ha you I, haven't heard? I per I don't, we haven't heard of okay. anything, but my impression is that they're not permitted to discuss cases that are brought okay. before them. Either they sort of go away or they pursue and they're in process, but we don't know. So I want to thank you. Thank you for supporting uh, this bill. We will certainly uh, to talk to the powers that be so we could have uh, to fund. Uh, we certainly don't want you to have 19 employees to have more work with less resources and, and people to do it with. So we'll definitely uh, be pursuing and following up uh, to get you the level of support that you deserve. Actually, I think you deserve much more for all the things that Councilman Ben Kalos uh, just mentioned and other uh, responsibilities that you have. Thank you so much. Thank you for inviting us to speak. Thank you. And with that, I'm going to be calling community boards. First panel. The first panel, Kim Brown, community board number five. Shirley Alonso, community board nine. And Rosemary Genty, community board eight. Can you? Okay, for community board 11, Angel, Miss Kane. We only have two panels, so for the rest of the community boards, we got you. Okay, uh, when you identify yourself, if, if you can mention the borough that you're with, because as you know, community board one, Manhattan could be in the Bronx, community and so, and so forth. So, yeah, you may begin. And sorry, we'll also swear you in, if everyone could just raise their right hand. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee, and to respond honestly to council member questions? Is this on? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Well, <coughs> to begin with, uh, Councilperson uh, Chair Cabrera, other community board uh, council members, thank you very much for affording us the opportunity to testify. I'd like to submit a testimony. Um, I'm sorry. I am Ken Brown. I am the district manager of Bronx Community Board 5. Thank you very much for allowing us to submit testimony, particularly regarding the uh, allocation of the $42,500 to supplement our district office's uh, budget. Um, <coughs> attention to the needs of the community board districts is greatly appreciated. As, the, as we are the level of government that is most intimately connected with the community, it is most welcome that we are receiving consideration of our needs. Anything that can improve the operations of the community district offices is a boon to the com community members that live and work in our neighborhoods. The allocation of $42,500 to our district offices operations was the most welcome boon. Thank you, Councilperson uh, Cabrera and all the members of the uh, City Council. These monies will go and have gone a long way towards improving the operations of the community board offices. 
We have and intend to use the monies to buy needed equipment for our office, purchase promotional items that will be of use to community at community events, uh, such as free giveaways, and to improve community events by providing additional resources such as petting zoos at street fairs, for example. And although the allocation of the 42500 as a one-time application is greatly appreciated, we would like to respectfully recommend um, improvements for any future allocations. These are to institutionalize this allocation so that it can be incorporated in an ongoing basis into our district office's budget, to remove, to remove the prohibition on using the monies for capital expenditures, our office could have break greatly appreciated this money if we had been able to use it to make improvements in our office's telecommunications and physical infrastructure. We request that the uh, parking permit privileges of chairpersons of community boards and the community coordinator in the district offices be reinstated, that the um, that community board budgets, uh, particularly for personnel, be increased on a permanent basis so that we can hire more staff due specifically in our district to the increase in population and diversity thereof. And finally, we request that the, um, that the Euler privileges that had hitherto, hitherto been afforded to community boards be reinstated. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Good afternoon. Thank you, Chairperson Cabrera and Council Members on the committee. My name is Shirley San Andres Alonso. I'm the Assistant <coughs> District Manager on behalf, uh, here on behalf of Bronx Community Board 9. Um, community Board 9 is the largest community board in the borough of the Bronx. We have an estimated 50,000 more residents than the second largest community board in the borough as per the New York City Planning Community District Profiles. This means we have nearly four times more residents than the smallest community board in the Bronx yet we receive the same funding as every other community board. Naturally, we receive more service requests and are in need of more resources to meet this need. As a result, we propose to receive funding proportionate to our population needs. Much like city council districts, NYPD, DSNY, and DOT, for example, who are allocated funding based on their geographical area and needs. Each of the 59 community boards throughout the city are allocated the same budget of $233,911 annually. However, as previously stated, these community boards are not parallel in size. This means that some community boards require more resources than others. As a result, some boards may not max out on their budget. We are working with the Comptroller's of Office to get an exact figure regarding how much money has been returned in the last three years. We propose to be able to reallocate these unused funds to community boards in need of a larger budget. Thank you. Thank you. Well, good afternoon. We have Chris. Chris. It's not written. There we go. Now, now I'm on. Um, uh, good afternoon, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. My name is Rosemary Ginty, and I am chair of Community Board 8 in the Bronx. Uh, I'm here today to testify in favor of the enhanced funding for our community boards. It is our request that you continue to support our work at the funding level uh, approved last year. Namely, in addition to our base budget, uh, the addition of the $42,500 for the uses of technology upgrades, uh, furniture, consultant contracts, and community events. Thanks to the speaker, this committee, and the council as a whole, especially our council member Cabrera, for this extra funding. Uh, we have been underfunded for too many years, uh, but now can add services and technology so essential to our work in the community. Our board is now able to join the 21st century, finally, uh, with technology upgrades. Uh, our, uh, after dealing with constantly broken telephones, virtually daily, uh, we are upgrading our phone system and will additionally upgrade our internet system. These important systems help our office do the work needed to help the community. Uh, and this is the truth. I swore the truth. I, uh, our phone system is barely in the middle of the 20th century. I, I think the only 
technological advantage is it's not a rotary system. Those of you who are old enough to remember, we have push button phones and that's the only thing modern about our telephone system. Um, so in addition to the technology upgrades, our committees have been uh, putting together great events for the community. Uh, we're gonna celebrate the 100th anniversary of women's suffrage uh, with our Education and Cultural Affairs Committee hosting a lecture series, including the role of Bronx women in efforts towards women's suffrage. Uh, we are going to have an intergenerational event that's been planned by our youth committee and our aging committee, something the community is very excited about. It's gonna be very interesting. Our housing committee is planning a forum. Our transportation committee is planning a bike safety forum. Um, uh, with the remaining funding, we're preparing for a long-awaited office move uh, and hopefully buy some new furniture, desks, chairs, because our furniture is truthfully 25 or 30 years old. Um, we also uh, do use our funding for um, guides for our community. We have done a senior guide full of very good information for the community and we've translated it into Spanish. We have done a housing guide for the community. We are now starting to translate this into Spanish and we've done a parks guide. So all of these things, we, we don't waste the money. We spend it on the community and outreach to the community. So again, thank you for this opportunity. None of this would be possible without this extra money. It really makes a difference. Uh, Community Board 8 respectfully requests that the enhanced funding be continued in the next fiscal year. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. Um, my name is, uh, good afternoon, Chairman Cabrera and members of the Governmental Operations Committee. Um, my name is Angel Muskane. I'm the District Manager of Community Board 11 uh, in East Harlem. Uh, I testified before this committee at uh, last year's budget um, hearing and I was very you know, glad to see uh, that the chairman and the committee and the council, uh, frankly, was able to champion community boards uh, to the tune of $42,500 for each community board. It was very much appreciated and useful for, um, for our board and for, you know, from, from the calls that, we, that the council member's office has organized with all the community boards across the city, clearly useful to all of them. So we thank you very much for that. Um, before I enter into my written testimony, I just wanted to add another piece. Uh, on a personal note, it's, 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 uh, it's a bit frustrating that though we have these champions, um, you know, uh, Council Speaker was on the call a couple of weeks ago also speaking on our behalf. Council Member Kalos is very, has been very supportive of, you know, the community board and as has been Council Member Ayala and Powers and Perkins to make sure that I hit all the ones that represent my district. Um, it, it is very frustrating to see that, the, that you know, the mayoral administration hasn't yet jumped on board to understand just what it is that community boards do and why it is that we are important. You know, there's 59 of us all across the city. I can't pretend to speak for all of them. I will just speak on my own behalf, but I can imagine that they feel similarly, um, that they work very, very hard with you know, 50 volunteer members to do um, not only uh, what we're mandated to do by the charter, but also what over time we've asked to participate in and that frankly has, can at times be overwhelming. We've asked for a ton and we don't have the resources to address that whole ton. Um, so I'll stop uh, freelancing for a second. Um, so uh, community board offices, as you know, see an endless number of applications, constituent complaints, public hearing notices, and community planning exercises, while also being responsible for, provi for pro providing its membership and constituency with the necessary information they require to meaningfully participate in these processes. All of this is done with what is often just three staff members, including the district manager. <laughs> We are, again, we are very thankful for Council Member Cabrera's ongoing advocacy on behalf of supporting community boards and for the $42,500 that the council was able to allocate to us as part of the fiscal year 2019 budget. These funds have been and are being utilized in a variety of useful ways depending on the needs of individual boards across the city. However, because these funds were a one-time allocation from council initiative funds and could not be used for personal services, we could not, excuse me, we could not add professional staff which we would benefit, which would benefit many of our offices. 
We again ask the council to consider a baseline increase to the annual budget of community boards. Increasing the budget would allow boards to hire additional professional staff as well as investing in the necessary technology or to better perform, to better perform our duties as staff and board members. For example, having a database to easily catalog and retrieve resolutions or a constituent management system that would allow community boards to improve record keeping, enhance communication with their constituents, and be more transparent in the age of open data. We respectfully request that the council consider these increases to allow us to enhance our resources so that we may better perform our city charter mandated responsibilities. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, <clears throat> I first want to take a moment to thank our speaker, Corey Johnson, because literally at the 11.59 hour uh, during a budget negotiation when, Andrew, you mentioned the administration refused. Thank you for pointing that out. Uh, to baseline, I mean, we're not talking about in the overall budget, we're not talking about a tremendous amount of money, right? We're talking about very little money that will go very, very far in the front lines. And as Shirley, did I get you now right? <coughs> as Shirley mentioned, uh, her community board, as I recall from the top of my head, you service about 200,000 uh, constituents. That's more than council members represent. And yet, uh, you have not received, you only received $27,000 since 2011 in terms of resources coming your way uh, for all those years. That was, it was insane when that you know, came to my attention. That's why I want to thank my colleagues in the committee as well. Uh, we had 100% yes. Uh, last year in terms of the council, so I salute them. But we need them baseline because you can't, you can't use them, you can't use this funding for salaries. Uh, and, and, and then it has you doing, you know, uh, you know, it puts you in a situation where it makes it very difficult to make decisions that you know you need to make for your board. Uh, and it, it just, you know, is put you in an unfair position. So um, I, do, I did have a one question related to <coughs> the newly created Civic Engagement Commission, which uh, will be implemented in April 1st of this year, and is directed towards uh, providing additional resources and expertise to community boards citywide. Has your board been in communication with the mayor's office concerning Civic Engagement Commission? Anybody? No. Very interesting. We're talking about. Well, the question, okay. Uh, it was mainly directed towards them. Have they, they haven't been in communication uh, with you at all? Okay, that's good to know. And that question will follow up. We'll, we'll, we'll get to the next panel, but uh, I assume that the answer uh, will be the same. Councilman, do you have any questions? Please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I appreciate that uh, you all took the time to be here. Um, I had a couple of questions about uh, your interaction. Uh, the main point of, or one of the main points of uh, this oversight hearing is your interactions with the Board of Standards and Appeals. Do you have, uh, and you could just, you know, one at a time indicate the answer. Do you have any variances or have you had any variance applications or special permits in the last year or two in your board? We, we just had one today before, uh, well, tomorrow we're gonna have one, yes, we do. Okay, mm -hmm. and you, but you've just had one now, right? One is, it, it, it's tomorrow, happening we'll right now. on tomorrow, yes. Any in the okay. past? Yes, uh, for me, yes. Okay, mm -hmm. and how did your, uh, how did your board uh, recommend? We've had a few variance requests since my tenure. I've been district manager about a year and a half or so. Um, primarily on the basis of the reputation of the institutions that were asking for the variance, that carried a lot of weight with our board. So your, board's re your board recommended yes in those instances? I believe so, yes. Okay. Yes. Are you aware if the, if the Board of Standards and Appeals granted the variance as uh, in the way in which you recommended a yes vote? In other words, you. When you recommend a yes, you have the ability to recommend with stipulations, or you have the, or you can recommend yes uh, straightforward. Do you recall? 
Um, I don't think that any stipulations have ever been part of the discussion. I think that so they recommended straight yes votes. Yeah. Okay. Do you, are you aware if the Board of Standards and Appeals uh, ultimately approved the application as was submitted to the board? As was submitted to your board? Again, um, I don't recall. Okay. I think not. Anyone else? So we, we, we see quite a few, and well, not quite a few. But we, if we you could shout the other mic while over. the other one's gone. Thank you so much. We, we've seen uh, a, a few BSA applications in my time at Community Board 11. I've been there eight years. Um, we've seen a, a few uh, various applications for uh, physical culture establishments. Um, we just received one for the reschool on 104th Street that's looking to build a little higher. Um, one that we did opine on that ultimately was, was, was passed, but the project had to change was the Marymount School on 98th Street. Your, um, opinion, your, your recommendation was a yes vote or a no it, vote? It, it, or was a, yes it was a yes with conditions. Yes with stipulations, right. okay. Yeah. And the, that project kind of was dragged through BSA for quite a while. Um, there were a number of challenges. Councilmember Kalos was against the project. Um, so there were a number of changes to the project ulti ultimately before the BSA gave us yes. Okay, but those those changes tend to happen because the BSA talks to the the, the proponent. Mm -hmm. D are you aware if your if your stipulations uh, recommendations were taken into account that those some of the things that you saw later uh, when the application was ultimately granted by the board by the BSA did they take into account what the community board had recommended? In that case, yes. Excellent. Because, because okay. one of our major concerns was the height of the building. Very good. It was All a right. very tall building in the middle of the block. Excellent. Anybody else? Ma'am? I, I echo Ken. We've had, we've had um, a few, and our, without stipulations, our recommendations were yes, and, and they were passed. They were passed by the board with no changes from the original project. Correct. Excellent. Go. Uh, of applications over the years. Uh, it would be, I think it would be unfair of me to tell you exactly what happened in each one. My board tends to have split votes and sometimes yes, sometimes no. It, split it, votes are good things. Split votes are good things. Yes, they are. It's, it's, it's a very, very big community debate sometimes on issues. Um, uh, the, the, one th the one aspect that does stick out for me is what you were just having the hearing on. There were a number of applications that came to us five, 10, 15 years late. Their date had passed and they were coming to us to legalize the something. legalization of something that exactly. had expired. Exactly. Okay. I, I, I do have a very vivid memory of a number of those cases which are very, fr very frustrating. For How did your board uh, tend to uh, rule in, on legalization cases? Well, it, it, you or, is know, there, or is there no rule? There's, uh, there's, you know, kind of each one is a case on its own. Each one is a case on its okay. own and you know, it's, it's very frustrating, needless to say, and, and that frustration gets voiced, but um, we really do uh, act on what's in front on of the us. merits. Right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. All right. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you so much. Well, I want to thank you all for the great work that you're doing and uh, looking forward to this year to see how we could be of further help. And with that, we'll go with the next uh, so final panel. Be, this this one be a panel of five. So There's going to be five. So if we could add an extra chair there. Uh, Jesse Budice, Community Board 4, Manhattan. Sean Campbell, CB. 14 Brooklyn, uh, Josephine Beckman, CB10 from Brooklyn, Darlene Jackson, uh, don't have a community board uh, number there, and Noel, uh, Noel Hidalgo from Beta NYC. Boards, so Mr. Imbalga doesn't need to be sworn in, but the community boards could please raise their right hands. Uh, okay. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and are you representing a community board? I'm not representing Sorry. <laughs> oh, okay. You're on the community board. Okay, then you, you don't need to be sworn in. Just the, just the community board members. Sorry. Okay. 
Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? Thank you. Okay, you may begin. Good afternoon, Chair Cabrera, Speaker Johnson, and the fellow members of the Committee on Government Operations. My name is Jesse Bodine, and I have the privilege to be the District Manager of Manhattan Community Board 4, representing West Chelsea, Hudson Yards, Clinton, and Kells Kitchen. Firstly, let me state that I'm grateful that I'm here today advocating for a continued increase in the Community Board's budget, rather than opposing a, a proposed cut. See before, thanks, Chair Cabrera, Speaker Johnson, for the increase in the OTPS budget for the fiscal year 2019. Over the last four years, CB4 has had the highest number of land use actions in all of the 59 community boards. As a result, CB4 routinely finds itself, similar to other boards, in a reactionary position to the varying issues impacting the neighborhoods it represents. The increase in the OTPS budget allows CB4 to transition away from simply reacting reactionary responses to rezoning proposals um, and, and towards proactive, pre, uh, repre uh, I'm sorry, representation of ongoing challenges such as gentrification and quality of life issues. For example, over, over, for over a decade, commu the community of Hell's Kitchen has advocated for the creation of a Hell's Kitchen historic district. This is a district highlights, uh, this district highlights the rich immigrant history of the neighborhood and preserves the tenement row house built environment. Over the years, CB4 has worked to organize the ma material needed for a formal preservation report. And with the increase of the OTPS funds, the budget can hire a consultant to produce a report to be review reviewed by the community at large and eventually submitted to the Landmarks Preservation Commission to help preserve the vital history of our community. Additionally, CB4 has four special zoning districts with its, within its borders that include anti-harassment and demolition restrictions for residential buildings. However, CB4 has witnessed over the last three years 10 buildings that were improperly demolished or partially demolished. Uh, forever resulting in the loss of over 100 residential units. With an increase in OTPS funding, CB4 has begun conversations with our local tenants' rights and housing organizations to go conduct con targeted tenant education outreach to the remaining buildings. Finally, with the additional OTPS funds, CB4 has been able to seriously explore ways to use technology to improve our service response to the community and collect key data. CB4 is collaborating with Google headquarters located within CB4 and its partners to create a series of online tools and constituent relationship management systems. Additionally, we also now have a web-based 24-7 language tra translation and ASL interpreter service to ensure wider accessibility to community business. As a last thought, I would like to strongly urge both the uh, City Council and the Mayor's Office to baseline these funds only by, uh, only by guaranteeing these funds for future years will community boards be able to plan pro and, and proactively meet their charter-mandated responsibilities. In closing, I want to thank you for your attention and look forward to working with you in the future. Good afternoon. I'm Sean Campbell, Community Board 14, Brooklyn, on behalf of Chairman Elvin Burke and my board members. I want to thank the committee first for this opportunity to testify and um, special thanks to Councilmember Cabrera for your ongoing support and the uh, insight that you bring as a, as a community board member to your work in the City Council. Um, I get to benefit from that in my work with Councilmember Yeager um, um, as well um, back in Brooklyn. For years, despite our efforts, appeals, and our data-backed budget requests, um, as well as your efforts to assist community boards more recently, we have not had a significant budget increase or additional capacity support tools such as access to CityNet or ongoing technical or analytic support. Um, yet additional responsibilities have been foisted upon our boards, budget responsibilities, privacy functions, etc. At the same time, our population is growing, land use, land use applications are expanding, and community requests for service delivery continue to increase, all putting a strain on the productivity of our three-person office. Um, so the funding provided to us this year could not have come at a better time. It was very important to our board that the money be spent on assisting us in our functions so that we serve the community in an ever better way and, and have a long-lasting impact. So. Two items, um, for example, are um, the funding will help offset the cost of what will be our 12th annual youth conference later on this month, serving over 500 young people preparing for their futures. We will also use the funding to expand the outreach and the function of an annual nonprofit roundtable. We will use that event to springboard a, uh, um, an improvement in our census count, which will bring us 
if, if we do well, additional federal resources and representation, again, having a long-lasting positive impact. But our big ticket item is going to be the development of a CRM system, and we have the um, the benefit of Neil Hidalgo here today, we're working with Beta NYC to develop a New York City Community Board tailored CRM system that will improve our, our ability to serve our community, our ability to communicate out to the community and our local elected officials um, and will surely increase our productivity. Um, however, that CRM system will hit a point of diminishing returns if the funding is not baselined into the budget. As our communities change and grow, we'll have to adapt to the system. As new board members, especially with term limits, um, come on board and staff eventually changes, training will be necessary. Um, so for that reason and to, to continue the improvement in our ability to serve the community, we hope that this funding gets, gets baselined to help us. Um, this brings me to our support for Intro 1095 because we think that also would improve our ability to serve the community. We support that um, notification of expiring special permits and variances prior to their expiration would be helpful in ensuring that stakeholders are advised and that we can better prepare and take a broader view of the application. Just recently, CB14 considered an application for a variance extension. Um, this came to us two years after the variance had expired. Um, it met with a good deal of community opposition. I feel like if we had been out in front knowing that that was about to expire, we could have addressed some of those concerns before they became community burdens. Um, I think sharing information with stakeholders who have an impact on the, on the outcome shouldn't even be a question. Um, and so for that reason, I trust this will pass. Again, Community Board 14 is grateful for this opportunity to support 1095 and to let you know that the funding that was provided this year was not just an expenditure but an investment in, in the future of our community as we all strive to make New York City a better city as, as, a, as a collection of ever better communities. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Good afternoon, Councilmember Cabrera, and I too want to thank you and the members of the committee and the City Council um, for having us here today and testifying before you. So my name is Josephine Beckman, and I am the District Manager of Community Board 10 in Brooklyn, which encompasses the communities of Bay Ridge, Diker Heights, and Fort Hamilton. I'd like to first offer my comments regarding Intro 1095, a local law to amend the Administrative Code in relation to the notification of exp the expiration of variances and special permits granted by the BSA. I support advanced notification to community boards. Um, if adopted, I assert this intro will help to ensure zoning compliance by creating a formal notice to property owners from the community board explaining that the application to the extended term of variance or special permit pending, its expiration may not be automatically supported. And we've too had a few that have come in after um, their terms have expired. Um, I'd also like to add that Community Board 10 most likely has a smaller number of variances and special permits than surrounding boards, and this change um, in, as a proactive notification would not be burdensome to staff. Currently at CB10, we proactively notify all of our SLA licensed owners three months before their expiration of licenses as a courtesy, so we are not overwhelmed with licensees who forget to renew. So we found that system to be very helpful, uh, to be proactive, and, and it's a benefit to both the, the property owners, licensees, and to ourselves. Um, I'd also like to share with the committee um, that a resident had contacted me about uh, use of a driveway at a commercial establishment, and I didn't even realize that there was a variant ascribed to the property. And when I, uh, because I didn't have that institutional knowledge, when I checked the BIS site, <coughs> I realized that I could not readily identify the property had a variance. The BIS is always my first stop to checking to look at the CFO certificate of occupancy and to see if there are active permits. Um, I had to contact BSA and look at my archives. I would recommend too that all BSA variances and special permits be hyperlinked to the BSA on the front page of the BSA. I think that would be a, a useful tool. I thought I'd throw that in while I had the chance. Mm -hmm. um, next I'd like to speak about community board operations and needs. FY um, 2019, Council initiative funding was extremely helpful to Brooklyn Community Board 10. We voted to use the funds to improve technology in the office and expand outreach. CB10 increased the broadband service in our office to meet our growing needs. Prior to this upgrade, we had fellows and interns in our office that would use their laptops to walk around the office in search of a signal so they could find a corner to complete their work. 
We also upgraded our technology computers. We have a large screen display instead of working with a projector and a pull down screen. More and more agencies of the City of New York are digitizing their filings, and we are now ready to display for committee members upon reviews of all these applications. We've also upgraded our phones with the help of DOIT to a Windstream digital system that provides us with logs of callers and messages. I, along with many of my board colleagues, uh, Brooklyn colleagues, have tried for many years working with DOIT to secure a license for a CRM. Um, a customer relationship management program that would really help us with our district needs. And as my colleague said, um, we really had no avail. But these funds we've set aside, working with Noel Hidalgo from Beta NYC, um, we're really hoping that this big achievement will be realized. And um, I and many other boards currently use spreadsheets or good old old fashioned binders. So it's projected that a CRM being constructed may have recurring maintenance costs into the fiscal year, which many boards are very concerned about. We've also done public outreach with the funds. We have a new digitized email newsletter. We've held um, and plan to hold future public forums and special events, one that's upcoming this spring with seniors and businesses on a senior resource guide. Moving forward, our ask to the City Council is for continued initiative funding to help us keep up with technology and administrative costs associated with performing our mandated responsibilities. It is our hope that the FY19 funds can be baselined so we can hire much needed staff to handle the growing number of zoning applications, administrative support involved, um, ever-changing needs of our district, and the cost needed to keep up constantly with advancing technology. So again, thank you um, on behalf of CB10. How are you doing? So my name is uh, Darlene Jackson. Um, so I'm happy to see that my, com my community board is here present from community board night in the Bronx. Um, but I'm actually here wholeheartedly to support a budget increase for all 59 community boards. Um, but I'm also a former employee at Manhattan Community Board 11 in East Harlem, and I was employed there for two years. Um, the last oversight hearing that you guys had was in March of last year, in which members and, and staff who are here today toward the 59 community boards advocated for a budget increase as such today for, for to enhance the outreach efforts, community engagement, service delivery, advocacy, and capacity building. Um, so I guess my question is, um, my question why I'm here today is to kind of understand the role of this committee as oversight to community boards because the two years that I've been employed at Manhattan Community Board, community board 11, there has been absolutely no oversight for, com for community boards. The budget increase that was received last year of July has not been utilized to date. Um, somebody mentioned, a district manager from CB11 mentioned that there's a three, a three staff person currently at CB11, but it's actually now only two. And last year when they were advocated for a budget increase, there has been a vacant full-time position since July of 2017, and now a part-time vacant position since the 14th of this month. So um, I'm here today because during the two years that I was working there, I spent a lot of idle time basically do, do not doing much to service the communities that we was charged to represent in, ser in service. And we had idle um, calls from constituents and even visits. And very, as far as the attendance from, from even board members was very at bare minimum. And you could probably hope that you even met quorum for, for those, those committee meetings. So my question is, is how can we ensure that taxpayer dollars and, um, and that the monies that, that are being allocated to community boards are being adequately used because right now I feel like it's being underutilized and it's being under uh, mismanaged and um, prior to my employment at Community Board 11 I didn't know that community boards even existed to my surprise a lot of New Yorkers don't even know that community boards are a platform for them to engage with their peers and their neighbors to interact with and to address the issues that impact them on a daily basis and it was very frustrating to, to work there for two years and the typical East Harlem residents didn't even know that we even existed and so I'm, I'm really more for a question as to how moving forward from this public hearing, because this is the third public hearing since, since me having knowledge that community boards exist, what does is, what is the oversight actually look like and to ensure that the capacity building is being reaching, it's, we're ensuring that it's being reached. And I'm gonna have no, Noel, right? Noel, who's, um, there's, a, there's, <laughs> there's been a lot of great resources that's available to community boards, but where do we, make, ho where do we hold accountable that it's actually being implemented at the community board level, because you have you have staff members, you have board members that actually go to these me these meetings at the BP's office, but it never actually transfers over to the staff that's actually employed at community board to actually implement it and to ensure that these resources that we as afforded to us is actually being to use 
effectively. So, Thank you. Um, my name is Noel or Noel. I'm a Gemini. I have two names, so feel free to use whichever one you want. Um, I've submitted some written testimony, but I'm going to um, summarize it and pretty much start on page two. Um, Beta NYC is a nonprofit organization that has over 5,000 members. We started off as a meetup in um, 2013. We wrote this thing called the People's Roadmap where we organized uh, our community to really figure out what are the things that we wanted to see carried forward from the Bloomberg administration into the next administration. And in that, we outlined 34 different policy proposals and, and ideas um, that we wanted to see developed. Um, some of that led to the creation of what we call now the Civic Innovation Lab and Fellows Program, which is incubated out of the Manhattan Borough President's Office. And some of the highlights of this particular program is that we've uh, educated, mentored, and employed over 50 CUNY undergraduate students, teaching them open data. This is the very first open data boot camp that is, exists in New York City. Uh, we've created a suite of specialized open data tools for community boards. Um, we've given to do it a number of suggestions on how communications technologies um, could be better utilized within community boards. We've done this through a very intense and um, ongoing research process, actively engaging community boards to ask them what are their technology needs, what are their data needs, what are the things that they would like to see accomplished over the next few years. This has led to do it actually submitting itself to the district needs process so that way community boards have an opportunity to directly engage communi um, with community boards, which is something that they uh, didn't have to do because they're not a service mandated uh, um, agency. And so, you know, getting do it to reform its practices um, has been a challenge. It has led to um, quite a bit of. Uh, discovery and understanding exactly how do it works and realizing that it's kind of frustrating. Uh, I can only imagine what it must be like to be a district manager for year in, year out, trying to ask the city's IT department to provide IT services for their agency. Um, and while we love do it and we have great friends at do it, um, I have now come to realize that do it is really just a contracting vehicle for technology and not really a city IT department. It's unbelievable that there is one IT person for 59 agencies, that there is Joe, the amazing Do It staff member who drives around to all 59 community board offices to do desktop tech, tech support. I started off my world doing tech support. I can't imagine having a car in a city and more or less doing IT out of a car every single day. Um, just to continue, um, so what we've been able to accomplish over the last few years is to build a very simple, easy to use dashboard uh, that visualizes 301 data. We've worked with Manhattan community boards to build a very simple template to track attendance. We've unified state and municipal data through this thing called SLAM, a state liquor authority map, which brings together sidewalk cafes, liquor licenses, um, and noise complaints, which is something that wasn't able to be easily done beforehand, and now community boards have this tool where they can see uh, bad neighbors. Um, lastly, we've been able to build a tool called Tenants Map, which visualizes um, buildings that have um, unusual activity in regards to uh, service level requests. These are um, service level requests that tend to lead to tenant displacement. Um, um, and so we present a tool that enables this information to be easily visualized. We're now at the point where all we've done two uh, detailed reports on the technology needs of community boards, and I've summarized them here, and I don't need to repeat the excellent things that they've already said, but I do want to add end on the explicit uh, need for a CRM. Community boards are desperate for a tool that enables them to do the constituent services that they're doing right now. We're living in the 21st century and it's absolutely inconceivable that these 59 agencies don't have someone or somebody that they can turn to to help digitize uh, and keep track of constituent complaints. My own community board has used these funds. Uh, I live in Brooklyn CB1, apparently to lease a car to better get around the neighborhood. I don't think that's a judicious investment in uh, uh, for the needs that I have as a constituent, but apparently for them, that's great. I would like um, to be working with 
Right now we have 11 community boards. We'd love to be able to work with more of them uh, to really start the process to start digitizing the workflow and the infrastructure that's needed so that way community boards can start servicing their districts in the 21st century, in, this, in the 21st century tools. Thank you so much. I, um, I have a couple of important questions, but I'm gonna turn it over. No. And, and that's your reward. You, you, you're the other council member who's here all the way to the end, always. So. That's my reward? Yes, all part right. of your reward. Um, you. Before I begin, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, before I begin, uh, just uh, full disclosure, because you may hear some favoritism in my questions. I was a member of uh, Brooklyn's Community Board 14 for 18 years. I joined when I was five. And um, uh, Ms. Campbell is the third district manager that I've been working with, and uh, she's incredible. So I'm just going to say that. I am grateful that you're here. And, and I will say what I didn't say in the first panel is that last year when we were talking about uh, the enhancement, uh, Mr. Chair, uh, for the community boards, and we did want it to be baselined. And I, and I do agree with uh, this panel and the previous panel. Um, frankly, it's, it's just hard to plan. You know, you have the 42.5 now, and what do you do next year? Which I think uh, is why um, you're seeing you know, some of these weird expenditures like, you know, go lease a car. Well, well, I don't know. What are they going to spend? The, I mean, how are they going to pay for that lease next year if they don't get the 42.5 again? And I don't know the answer. Um, Ma'am, the, the uh, one person who's not a district manager, and I, I didn't catch your name, uh, the, to the, your question of, of whether or not the 42.5 enhancement is being spent right, um, part of the conundrum is that boards may simply not be able to spend it because they can't use it on personnel services. And it almost means that they have to go out there and figure out what can we blow this money on that's going to be useful as opposed to go out and waste it. Um, I could tell you from my own perspective, I've been on this council for 13 and a half months. I turned back more money to the taxpayers than any other council member at the end of the last fiscal year. And I'm on target to do the same this year. It's not because their offices are worse than mine or, or uh, uh, worse managed than mine. It's because I find different ways to do things than they find different ways to do things. Um, so just you know, keep that in perspective. If you are truly concerned, though, about attendance, you should write your borough president, and that would be my advice to you. If the council doesn't oversee attendance on community boards, um, the I, I, I wanted to you know uh, last year I think uh, Mr. Miskane and I we engaged in a dialogue. I don't know if he's still here, unless he's behind. Anyway, okay, um, about about this kind of uh, you know uh, using Excel versus using uh, um, I think it was with you versus using a legal pad versus some people keep it in a binder, some people on a Word doc, and every board really does have this other, this different way of doing things. And I, I do agree with you, uh, Mr. Hidalgo, that the city should, uh, maybe we can write something that requires uh, do it to do it, but the city should create a citywide system um, that enables community boards to track constituent re requests, complaints, uh, uh, information um, in easily manageable way rather than you know a thousand manila folders and four file cabinets and it really doesn't make sense and um, I often say this I, I do mean it um, uh, not I actually said it in another hearing uh, uh, this morning uh, community boards are the Rodney Dangerfield of city government um, and you know they that's really where the ground is met um, I from my own personal perspective I actually uh, outsource some of my work to community boards. Sean will tell you and my other district managers will, will tell you that sometimes I come across something and I turn it over to them and I say, you know, can you uh, look into this? And, and they do. Um, and it's not because they're doing my job and it's not because I don't really want to do it. It's because they have the better knowledge uh, and ear to the ground than a, a lowly city council member like I. Um, I wanted to um, uh, just ask the and I, I realize that each of you are doing your constituent tracking in different ways, and I don't know that we can, we can give you a tool tomorrow, but I think it's something that the council should explore over the next year and as we go into the budget um, to talk about two, for me, the most important things is A, baselining that 42.5 so that you can actually plan, um, and, and B, to uh, take this burden off of you of, of doing data tracking, and I'm hopeful that we can maybe work with do it to figure out a way to actually create something that the city could use. Um, uh, Ms. Ms. Beckman, uh, you, you mentioned the, the inability of biz or, the, or, or you're not able to find information on biz that, that BSA, uh, for BSA variants. And, and um, my impression, and you know, the chair, and I'm grateful that the chair stayed with her staff, 
um, is that that is a, that's more, to me, I think, a DOB failure of not putting all the information that they have uh, once the BSA grants a variant, if I'm wrong, jump no, up. It's I not formal. I would agree with that. I, I think that I think that the problem here is that you know once once BSA has done its job, mm -hmm. they're done. They they close the file. They put it in the file cabinet until the next time it comes up. Or but it's done um, unless obviously there's an appeal filed, and it then goes back to the city agency, which is DOB. Which I don't think anybody from a community board who's here is going to tell you that their experience with DOB is just yay excellent. Mm -hmm. um, and and that's been my impression as a community board member. And I think what we have to do is figure out a way to get buildings to take the information that they're getting back from BSA. BSA is a 19-person agency. Maybe they get that extra administrative person to do the notices that we're going to require you to do. But they're a tiny agency, and it's, not, it's really not a good use, I think, of the agency's time um, and resources to, to, I don't know, to create some kind of extra step system where you know, if you're looking for something, go into biz and look at it, and then if it doesn't work, check out what BSA may or may not have done. You know, go to their website and check it out. I think it should really all be on DOB's website um, in an easily locatable fashion, and I think that's something that's not on BSA to figure out how to do. It's on DOB. I mean, Chair, if you're, you're right there. All right. No, no, no. It's all right. You know, it's just nod, and and I, I know you're with me on it. Um, I, I will ask the same questions, and Mr. Chair, thank you for your time, and I'm almost done. I will ask the same questions that I asked the previous panel, um, because I'm trying to get a feel for this. Uh, how many of you, uh, I kind of know the answer a little bit for 14, because I lived through the, those fights, but how many have had variances or special permits in your community boards over, say, the last two years? Okay, so that's, uh, that's 10 uh, in Brooklyn, and 14 I know, and I forgot. Four Manhattan, okay, so Four Manhattan is the biggie because everybody wants to build there. So uh, I'm going to leave you off because I, because I think your neighborhood is far more complicated <laughs> than than uh, us simpletons in Brooklyn, um, uh, or at least me. Um, have So when your variances come through, your special permits, I don't know if 10 has a special permit district. I don't think you do. We had one, but we... Uh, you got rid of it, right? Got rid of it, you got yes. rid of it on the Vinny, on Terror. the Councilman Gentilly. Yes. Okay. So... Um, for your variances and your special permits, uh, have you have you found that when you grant the yes, either with stipulations and then it goes up to the BSA process, that the result tends to be what the community board anticipated it would be? Yes. Okay. We've used stipulations very effectively. And and the and BSA and the BSA yeah. supports that. Okay. Yes. Board 14, we have had uh, we have a very large special permit area. Uh, the chair and and uh, I know with my predecessor in office and. Um, I, the council's predecessor on the land use committee have had uh, have had uh, conversations uh, of multitudes about it. Um, but have you found, uh, and, and I'm giving you the question even if I know the answer. But have you found that in your in either in the special permits, the variances? I know there are more special permits than variances in 14. That the stipulations process is working. That the BSA is looking at those and and uh, giving them the weight that you would hope that they would. Okay. And if the if uh, the board if the community board uh, you got to hit the button, uh, make it red. Okay. If the community board issues a yes with no stipulation, are you finding that the result from the BSA is exactly as the application was presented by the board? Or are you finding that ultimately it had to be changed because of BSA, because of BSA changes, or because it, it, of BSA it, requests? It varies. It, it varies. Um, it it off it almost always upholds okay. um, and, and sometimes takes additional steps. Okay. So one of the things that the, that the, uh, the BSA does, uh, which I find uh, helpful, is that it actually requires, um, if, a, if a community board, um, which, you know, we, we on community boards, uh, the, rev, uh, the chairman as well, you know, we've, we, we're at the low end of the government and then we send up our lofty recommendations and we always kind of wonder, well, what happens after that? You know, we move on to you know the the uh, crumb cake part of the evening and and then it's kind of you know we go to next month and what happens um, and I, I I am very happy that the board uh, that the board of standards and appeals requires applicants to address community board concerns and I think that's a very important part of the process um, and obviously the the BSA is an adjudicatory body so they they look at things differently than we do at community boards. Mm -hmm. um, but my, my question, I think, is, is whether or not there's so, there are things we can do to help the BSA um, hear us more clearly 
Um, and, and I'd be interested to know if you think that there are in this, you know, Board 4 in Manhattan can kick back in now. I'm if there are things, yeah, 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 come <laughs> okay. on back in. Uh, especially because you're the speaker's board, so, you know, we have to be nice to you. Sure, so, um, I mean, right. <laughs> but I want to say, first off, I think the, the work that BSA does is tremendous. And I think um, the response when I, when I personally call or a staff member calls to get an information about a specific application, what's going on with it, and By the way, same, same here on right. our side, and and from from the community board. When I before I came to the council, it was the same. You call the BSA, and you, you're pretty confident you're going to get an answer by the next day. Right. You know, do, they'll do the research, they'll do the hard work, um, and that's why I, I give them that huge pass on putting stuff on the website because it's just not that easy to to put these. I mean, some of these packages are are huge, and and they're constantly updating. And, and I find that most people that work within the BSA world, not the BSA employees, but the applicants and their attorneys know this. And so we have a, a handful of uh, land use attorneys that we see on a regular basis mm -hmm. who all come for the physical culture establishments, right? Mm -hmm. And we know how sort of arcane and sort of silly that whole thing is and how it's sort of morphing into a very different set reason for the law than or the, the yeah. permit than it, what it originally was. So we can have that conversation <laughs> offline. But I, 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 I will say, um, I think, uh, you know, with very rare exception, I'll mention a couple right now. Uh, we find that everything we, we're sp everything we write, everything is a condition. We always usually do a deny unless with stipulations. A That's denial a unless there are stipulations. No, den deny unless with stipulations, meaning like saying we, would, we wouldn't approve this application uh, without these things, and usually the applicant has agreed to them. I mean, that's that's sort of what the committee, the the applicant is happy enough to get out of our <laughs> out of our committee on that issue to say, okay, they'll agree to the hours, or they'll agree to the limiting the number of people in the gym, or they'll increase the the the, uh, the soundproofing for all of these things. So I mean, like gyms are become unique in our district because you get one probably every month or maybe twice a month sometimes. All these healthy people living very in healthy four. people in Chelsea. It's crazy. And so um, and it's and it's. I will say the tide has changed a little bit because I, I think originally you were seeing a lot of repurposing of already existing buildings into gyms, and I think they've realized that this that's a, a sort of a, a nightmare for them because th those buildings were not built for gyms. And so now we're seeing a little bit of a change. Um, I will say one thing that is difficult for community boards with um, uh, the BSA, with the gyms at least, is that there doesn't seem to be any connection as to you know, when the gym is going to actually be started. So like we recently just had an application for a gym with the building hasn't been built yet. So what's the what is the from a layman standpoint, point from a community boards member standpoint I mean what are they looking at? You know what are they they can't go see it. They can't go understand what the environment is. They're all they're hearing is sort of a presentation on to a bit about a concept. And so that is an interesting conundrum for us. It's and the, the uh, physical culture establishment special permits typically have an expiration date of 10, ten years, years from when granted by BSA. Right. Yeah. So, I, I, and we, I will say very, we, we are the home of Brick Gym, which is, mm -hmm. I think, one of the most notorious uh, P P PC applications. It's gone up and down and around and around, and, and BSA has been very responsive to our concerns about that and to the neighborhood and to the residents of that building's concerns about that. But we're seeing the other side of that, where an application will come in and it, it won't be it won't be anything to go and see, it won't be able to go and yep. look at, and we d maybe not even a representative of the build the gym, you know, management there to talk to. So it's difficult in that kind of situation. Um, in terms of the land use stuff, the other sort of building stuff, I got to say we've been are in predominantly very uh, it's a very fluid relationship, and and um, we have requested lower heights and BSA has listened to those and recognized those and maybe they, we don't always meet it, we don't always completely agree but the, the sentiment is there and understanding what we're talking about. Maybe we're asking for dropping it four to, to, to eight stories instead of 14 and they find it at 10. I mean it, it, it's a compromise so I think okay. in general we find that to be. Do you have situations where you approve without any stipulation? No, that doesn't happen. I in mean, in, in rare, well, I mean, I, I'll be honest with you. With the most recent one, which is the one that was a hole in the ground, there's not much to. <laughs> we just, I think we just sort of had to punt and say, yeah, I mean, that's fine. You know, I mean, it. it that's it, a physical culture establishment. It's physical okay. culture establishment. But in in, in in terms of land use, and, and any type of height, you know, changes or bulk changes or, you know, uh, or uh, you know that they're trying to find the five meet the five findings. No, we always come away with multiple stipulations. Okay, and board ten. 
thank you, Noel. Um, also for our physical culture establishments, we have um, put conditions on them, we, which we found very helpful. And, 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 the, and the BSA? And the BSA has always endorsed our recommendations. What about variance applications? Um, the same. Same, okay. Yes. You have any that you haven't put stipulations on that you find are later, the, the project as approved by BSA is not the same as came before the board? No. Okay, no. board 14. Red, grab the red. There you go. There you go. Doesn't respond to anything. <laughs> Can I answer that in a slightly different direction? Any way you want. Um, because I want to go back to the idea of a CRM. It's the C might stand out in your mind as a constituent or a client, but I want to think of the C in terms of community. And for, for permit, for special permit and variance applications, it's something else I want to start putting into a system. Because we tend to ask the attorneys that come before us if there's been, for instance, um, FAR, uh, if that number of FAR that they're applying for um, it exists in proximity to, to their application. I'd like to be able to pull this information out myself. I want to map my information. I want to know what, the, what that area of the community looks like going in. I want to sort of pull out how many applications have come before our board in a certain amount of time that, that we did recommend with stipulations. Essentially, you have not. to do that manually I right now. Yeah. Instead of pulling you out a manila four, file. Right. You mentioned having four file cabinets. We have 16. Mm -hmm. So it's a lot of digging to pull the information out when we want a, a broader view. Um, I uh, so enjoy your comments um, because uh, there's there's actually several layers that um, uh, that aren't really being addressed within the city's government operations um, that you have all really articulated on. Um, the first one is uh, around stipulations um, in multiple data sets. So in our research, we found that the SLA doesn't publish. Uh, any of the stipulations that they get. So the State Liquor Authority uh, doesn't publish their, the stipulations that community boards are sending up to the state, and then therefore community members like myself don't know what are the stipulations around a certain liquor license establishment and what are the kind of like the confines that they should be seeing in. We actually have to send, I have to send a FOIL request up uh, to Albany to find out what are the, the letters or start asking the bar owner or start rooting around uh, cabinets. And what, uh, what we've discovered through uh, a very detailed report that um, um, we'll, we published earlier this year is that there are uh, agency by agency, you can go through the different data sets and you will find that there are these kind of variances that aren't digitized anywhere. And I think it's kind of amazing that, that this small team of 19 has one IT person that's maintaining their database. And, and I was looking at their one data set that's up on the open data portal, and it really only tells me like whether or not what's the status of the application, and that doesn't help me as a constituent think about it when I'm coming to a public meeting to really understand what, what's in the details. And that's really speaking to a much deeper issue, which kind of goes back to my initial statement around how Doit is primarily an IT contracting services and not an actual IT building organization. We're living in the 21st century, I hope we can all recognize that, where uh, governments have been building software very efficiently for about 10 years. I not did this, ours. Uh, not ours, not but ours. yet I did that just a few floors up as part of the state senate 10 years ago and helped build the CRM for the state senate, which is still in place, which is significantly cheaper than the mainframe system that was put in place. We actually did a launch of nysenate.gov in this room using open source software. And something that has been uh, at loggerheads inside of our city's operations is the fact that there isn't a very clear adoption of open source. There isn't building tools inside of the city to very quickly uh, uh, identify problems or opportunities where we can make minor modifications to these systems and help increase the usability. And so. Something that Beta NYC has been calling for is that New York City government needs to build a digital services department along the lines of the U.S. Federal's Digital Services Agency, uh, or ATF, which are essentially the best and the brightest uh, that live uh, in this nation who want to build technology for government to make government more efficient and to send uh, or be more efficient about how our tax dollars are spent. And it is surprising that um, for the last 10 years, 
both mayoral administrations have not taken up this particular issue to figure out how to build technology within city government more effectively. We have little tiny pinpricks. Mayor's Office of Economic Opportunity it has a civic service design studio. Uh, at city Planning Labs is doing a great job of incorporating open source tools, so city planning officials have modern 21st century tools. We have Doris, uh, they rolled out and repurposed some tool that was built in, in Oakland. But these are miny, minor pinpricks at a $89 billion budget when we should be, instead of sending those our tax dollars out to you know, essentially buy technology from someplace else, we should be building it here and employing our local uh, technologists to build technology for our city. Um, am I able to add response to your comment? <laughs> um, so just listening to everybody's testimony <laughs> in regards to the databases that they're advocating for, which I wholeheartedly agree, sorry, um, again, it, br it brings me back to the question about oversight. So how are we, what does oversight look like to ensure that the resources that are available um, to community boards to ensure that they're actually implementing it to provide adequate services to the, to the communities that they are representing to charge to serve. So I know you, you mentioned something about the BP's office in charge of attendance. Um, is I know the BP is almost like the umbrella of community boards, but I haven't seen, from my experience, um, how they provide oversight to ensure that there's, there's, there's a capacity building to ensure that um, constituents are being serviced, that constituents know that community board actually exists in the community, that these resources that's available to community boards are actually being like implemented. Um, so I know you in the first panel, somebody mentioned about the Mayor's Commission with the Civic Engagement Task Force. Is that gonna be something where oversight can be linked I'm just trying to get, I just want to make sure that I leave well, out I, of here. Yeah, I, I mean, my district voted no on it, and I don't have a lot of great faith in it. My district voted no on all three questions because we don't have great faith in it. Um, so you're not going to get me to tell you what the Civic Commission is going to do or not going to do, but I will tell you th again that the community boards are, are uh, independent agencies, and they're op one of the things about their independent agencies, th the fact that they're independent agencies is that um, their chairs and the members of their boards, the other 49 members, together with their employee, the district manager and the district manager staff, make the decisions about how they function. And when it comes to spending, uh, they have the authority to make those decisions whether or not they're going to spend or, or not spend. If the council and the mayor agree to give a community board an extra $42,500 and the community board can't find a way to spend it or chooses not to for whatever reason, um, and my guess is, by the way, if a particular board is not spending it, it's because they can't find a way to do it. Because remember that it's a, it's a very, they have to be very careful that whatever they're spending it on is a one-shot deal because the administration and the council did not make this a recurring thing, uh, uh, which is for, for year after year, which is called baselining. And if we would have done that, maybe it's our failure, but if we would have done that, then the community boards would be able to say we're going to spend 42.5 on this because we know every year we're going to have it. They don't know that they're going to have it. And I, I, again, on attendance or anything else, I would just encourage you to write your borough president or call your borough president's office. <coughs> Mr. Chair, thank you very much for your time. No, no problem. I wanted to just add uh, that <coughs> it really was in the <coughs> – sorry, I'm finding something here. But it was in the fall of the council uh, – it was really the administration refused to baseline it. I mean, we waited until the last possible minute. And as I started earlier in our conversation today, if it wasn't for sp Speaker Corey Johnson, it would have ha not happened. So uh, really, we, we, we really try our best because we knew the challenges that were going to uh, come before you if it was not baseline. So this is why. I'm calling upon all the community boards to come. This is our commercial uh, for next month. Uh, we're we looking at May 11, uh, 12, May, March, March, March 12. I'm sorry. Uh, that's uh, for so March 12 for the community boards to come and to uh, to continue lending their an echo together in a concert of voices together that we need to baseline. Uh, and again, we're not talking about astronomical amount of, of funding. Uh, I did wanted to uh, ask you about what I had asked before. You just mentioned uh, uh, the commissions regarding the Civic Engagement Commission has the 
mayor's office, anybody, government operations from their side, any kind of little beep in the radar, anything? No, no ping uh, from that side. Okay, so uh, uh, Council Mayor Yeager did a fantastic job in really addressing some of the questions that I had. Um, but I want to thank you for the work uh, that you all do in community boards. Thank you as a community member who was involved in community boards. I did have one last question regarding uh, Hidalgo. I can't let you go easy like that. Hidalgo, regarding the, from what I understand, it would cost $10,000 for community boards to have the system in place. Is that correct? Um, so we're estimating... How do, how do I, to get the diversity of community boards that we have right now, there are multiple steps that need to happen. Some community boards are using email as their CRM. And so what we've proposed is um, a low cost um, method to start um, and furthering our existing research to turn around a solution that immediately meets their needs. It's essentially going to be a glorified online uh, spreadsheet that helps us identify essentially the types of columns and the data that goes into those columns that will then help us better understand how to turn an open source CRM, something that we would be downloading from GitHub or anything like that, and turn <coughs> that tool into the future perfect CRM. So the $10,000 is a, um, it is our most generous estimate with the 42.5 that has been offered to figure out how to essentially fit into the community board's budget uh, to give them an immediate tool that helps us start this broader conversation. So here's, here's what I'm trying to lead at, <coughs> which is, can this be capital funding? If there was capital all allocated, which for us, to be honest with you, is easier. If somebody were to allocate a certain amount of capital, can this be positioned as infrastructure uh, type of money uh, so we could give a one time, uh, let's say if it's 600,000, 700,000 to do all the community boards all in one shot and that way we have a system that uh, everybody could benefit from and, and then my second question, if the answer is yes, which I hope is yes, uh, can uh, it, it, would there be additional fees uh, required on a yearly basis? And if so, how much? Uh, so yes and yes. Oh. Um, okay. Um, I think w one thing that was stated in the previous testimony is to really understand that when you um, deploy a CRM, it is at the underpinning of the workflows inside of an office. Um, so. Yes, we can come up with a, a number that helps walk through all of these different steps to get and deploy a CRM that would be universally accessible to all 59 community boards that they can log in and that, the, that they can start using. There will be ongoing costs to figure out exactly how many features need to be developed, what type of support and training. Right now, we try to do, Beta NYC tries to do one training per month uh, to teach community boards how to use BoardStat, SLAM, and a bunch of other existing tools that DOB has produced and other city agencies have produced. Um, and that's time intensive to do those types of trainings. Um, it's also time intensive to be thinking about what are the updates and improvements. So uh, the quick answer to your questions are yes and yes, and love to figure out exactly what those numbers look like. Um, but there will still need to be dedicated funding for training, support, improvements, um, because community boards have a, as you know, have a very limited budget for their current operations, and yet the needs of every single community board that we've talked to is only growing exponentially. Every single time an agency decides to go paperless, they put the burden on the community board 
to print out the paper to essentially ensure that the community is informed of, uh, of what's going on. We had a conversation a few years ago when DOB was rebuilding their thing or planning was rebuilding their thing and they were like, oh, community boards, we're gonna save you paper. And we started looking at the numbers for just Manhattan Community Board One and it's just like, you guys are gonna need to buy more and more toner cartridges, like get a better uh, printer copier. Like the, their needs are going up when agencies, other agencies say that they're trying to save money. And so this is an ongoing conversation that you and your predecessors all need to understand that community boards need dedicated technology resources across the board. So I would like to meet with you. Yes, go ahead. Please. If you could turn that one on and the other one on. This is purely as an example. So three years ago or three or four years ago, you know, the city decided that they, they were tired or overburdened with reviewing each of the boards uh, budget requests and statements of district needs, right? Because everybody would do it differently. Some would be a two-page letter, some would be 34 pages, right? And so they said, we're gonna cut that all out and we're gonna in-house build something, right? I don't think they spent any money on it. I think they charged them themselves what they would normally spend on what they would, on t IT stuff. And they built this pro uh, a web-based platform for all of us to every year put into our, put in to the, all of our budget requests and all of our statement of district needs. That has resulted into basically, in my opinion, and I cannot say speak for the community boards here or in general, but I think most community boards now find themselves doing double the work. Because what they do is the platform is simply built for the, for the agency side. It's, it's a whole thing was purposely for the agency to see it all in a drop down menu and it's all very simple. But it doesn't make it easy for the 50 community boards to review the document, to understand it, and to then to, to vote on it. So what you have is then community board members or board office staff having to create a second user-friendly document, right? And we've been going back and forth with DC, DCP who's in charge of this process. And, they, and the staff have been great. I wanna say they've been very responsive. They made the small, ch some minor changes and very effective changes to the whole process. But the overall concept was not made from a for point of view of community boards. It was made from how does this make it easier for sanitation and transportation to answer these questions and give them, give carbon copied answers back sometimes, right? And so I just wanna voice that as a concern is that we, we, we want something, but it really does have to come from the groundswell of community boards needs and not simply just said, okay, we're gonna package something and give it to you and this is what you got, you know, because it's gonna take a while to work itself out. If I could add to that, Council, really quick is that the digital divide is great varying on communities. Our communities, 30% um, residents are 60 or older. And many of our community board members, you know, are just not as sophisticated with the computer as some of the younger members or, or even staff. So when we have a zoning application that's now sent to us digitally and, and on a, we have to be able to present that. Some members don't have a Dropbox and even if we email, they don't have a clue on how to open it. So some of these small um, you know, technology changes, which are great, are really problematic for us boards. Um, and even getting that technology and, and educating ourselves and then teaching our board members has become quite challenging um, for us uh, as well. I think that's to his, the point Don was making that there's gonna be a requirement really uh, for training to take place. But I would love to sit down with you at some point in the very early, near uh, future, uh, because I think there's a way to get some capital and to do all the community boards. Why, you know, just doing 10 here, 20 over there, and, and get everybody on, on board, uh, and then be able to get you the tools. I always tell my wife, I say, baby, never ask me to do a job without giving me the tools. <laughs> give me the tools, I'll, I'll go to the highest mountain for you, but give me the tools, and you need the tools. I, as you know, I'm a former community board member, and I used to be very frustrated myself. Uh, when we didn't have the tools, it just seems like everybody else, as you mentioned, the other, everything is for the benefit of the other agencies, and yet the, those other agencies have the millions and millions of dollars, you know, and, and operations, and so, and then the community boards are trying to do a whole lot with very little, and this is why we're gonna continue to advocate for you. So I wanna thank you all uh, for your wonderful work.
and please come March the 12th. Let your other colleagues know we need everybody on board. Some of this information that came out today, we're going to need it back again. The administration will be listening. And so this is very, very useful. Uh, it's going to help us also develop better questions for next time. But as closing here, ladies and gentlemen, I, normally I close with a big gap. But Brad Reed uh, deserves that honor and much more. This is his uh, very last hearing as the counsel for this committee. I, I, I need some picture here. Come on. I, I, this, this is a memorable <laughs> moment. We cannot let this moment escape. <laughs> and unto you has been given the power. <laughs> he actually looks like Thor. Shorter hands. <laughs> committee on Governmental Operations. Committee on Governmental Operations stands adjourned.